Good morning, everyone. This is Lori DeToro from eMate and Fluke Excelix. Thank you for joining us for this month's Best Practices webinar. As software and sensor providers, we offer an array of webinars and other education, including product demos and product training. Our Best Practices webinar series focuses not on our technology and software, but on maintenance strategies and solutions with speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. We are really pleased to have with us today Han Tran, Product Application Specialist at Fluke, who will be presenting today's topic, Managing Power in Your Facility. Good morning, Han. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Lori. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. While listeners are logging in, I wanted to ask you a question, and I'm sure there's a lot you can say to this question, but um, um, as we're waiting, why do you think uh, plants struggle to monitor power? Uh, uh, yeah, that's like you said, a great question. I can go on for a long time about it. Uh, basically, it comes down to time, right? Um, it's facilities that are already under a lot of stress to keep up uh, the uptime for their machinery don't have that time to be proactive. Um, they're usually putting out fires, sometimes literal fires, um, but they're just in reactive mode at that point. And there's really no time for them to think about how they can get ahead of the issues before, you know, they become catastrophic or they take down a machine. And the other factor too is fear of what they might find out. It sounds kind of funny, but sometimes you just don't want to know. <laughs> some some people just don't want to know what the issue is. And I, I completely understand that. Um, sometimes just operating under uh, that kind of stress, that kind of um, schedule, it's it's tough to say, hey, let's all stop, take a break, and really dig into what we're, we're monitoring, if we're monitoring at all. And then for some people, it starts at, you know, level one, uh, in a way, it starts at, well, what, what do we monitor? So it's, it's both time, or lack thereof, it's fear of what they might find out. And then the, th the third thing, too, is don't know where to start. You know, um, sometimes it can be a very intimidating subject power, um, especially if you haven't had to deal with it in a real world basis and in terms of monitoring it and how to um, kind of get into that predictive, both predictive, preventive, and then also condition monitoring. Um, but, you know, Fluke, Fluke's been pretty good at trying to lead the, the innovation in terms of handheld tools that can help you towards that predictive and preventative maintenance. And they're definitely um, between XLX and everything that is happening with Fluke Cloud and all the handheld tools and the sensors. Fluke's kind of making making headway. I haven't really seen any other company um, put everything together this way for maintenance and facilities for upkeep. Um, and I come from a, a, I can talk more about my background later, but I come from a condition monitoring company um, before I came to work for Fluke. I, I was with Bentley Nevada. So, um, you know, Fluke's getting there. They're definitely, they're, um, they're, they're getting there with their cloud services. They're getting there with their sensors, um, being able to monitor voltage and current and now vibration and thermal. Um, it's it's coming together. I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty happy with what I see here with XLX. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Um, before we get started with the presentation, um, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. So the phone lines are muted to minimize background noise. We will save time after the presentation for your questions. So you can use the questions feature on GoToWebinar to submit your questions and comments at any time during Han's presentation. And I'll read them to Han so she can respond during our Q&A period at the end of our webinar. If you'd like to receive a copy of today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of our presentation today. The recorded webinar will also be available in eMate University on the eMate website. So again, please send us your questions as Han is presenting. And Han, I mean, we can go ahead and get started. Sure, great. Thanks, Lori. 
All right, so today we're gonna review how to manage power in your facility. Why should you care about power, power quality and energy? Um, what is energy? Uh, what is what is it versus power? What happens if you do nothing about power quality issues? Where should you take these power measurements? And then after all these measurements have been taken and all this monitoring has been done, what do you do with the data? So these are some of the basic types of power quality tasks carried out. Frontline troubleshooting is primarily carried out by the frontline technicians and most often in the industry. Load studies are increasingly being used as part of the effort in energy audits with the phrase, um, you can't manage what you can't measure being used. The load study is used as a benchmark to understand what is being used now and compare to a later study when saving steps have been implemented. The requirement for load studies is also detailed in uh, National Electric Code. The purpose of it is to provide more information about loading of circuits compared to additional loads for connection to circuits. So basically, if you want to add a load to your facility, um, we would recommend doing a load study. And energy and power go hand in hand. I know that first section that I just covered or the first few sentences I just said is very energy focused. The thing about going and doing power studies is that if you want to truly maintain your facility, it, it takes energy logging as well as going and troubleshooting power quality issues and getting ahead of that. So the two are very much interlinked. If you do just the one, you only have one leg of your uh, stool to stand on. The third leg would be other things like thermal and um, vibration analysis, for example. So you'd use these long-term recordings to um, either find intermittent problems that occur or when loads are particularly sensitive and it's important to have data available immediately um, should a, prob a problem occur. Examples of this type of environment would be in semiconductor plants or data centers. And quality of service to customers is becoming increasingly important to users with sensitive loads. And these users expect the utility to have power quality at an acceptable level about 24 seven. So by either monitoring continuously or carrying out regular power quality benchmarks, the overall system health, power health can be compared over time and potential problems identified before they disrupt um, operations. Why bother measuring power quality and energy? So energy is watching things like your, your uh, energy usage, your utility bill. In addition to that, you'd want to measure any kind of power quality issues before they happen. So this, this um, picture is kind of not it's you know during the event you want to get ahead of any issues like overheating motor and the reason why the bottom line why is really it's to save you from going down from your machine from going down and then it saves you money so the more uptime you have the more money you have obviously so many companies monitor the cost of oil and gas but the smarter companies are the ones that also pay attention to the quality of their power and their energy bill and measuring energy is the key to putting yourself in control of the utility bill and your facility and by measuring and looking at historical energy usage through the age of the facility, you can start to get a rhythm for the plant and understand where you can make improvements to your energy usage. And then measuring power and understanding the, the quality of your power is the key to ensuring that your plant runs less of a chance of being the victim of an unplanned outage. So understanding both energy usage and power quality is that one-two punch needed for maintaining a facility. And without these measurements, you would be flying blind um, and you'd constantly being reactive and putting out fires. So it pays to be energy efficient and to understand the power quality of your facility and the machines within your facility. Now, all too often, energy and power are used interchangeably, and this isn't quite accurate. What is the difference between energy and power? We know that 
one watt of electrical power maintained for a thousand hours equals one kilowatt hour of energy. Or a thousand watts maintained for one hour is one kilowatt of energy. It's kind of interesting if you do the math. But basically, when we talk about power, it's the rate at which work is done. So one kilowatt hour per 1,000 hours is one watt. When you are measuring power, the purpose is typically to measure the quality. There's also a factor of time, and this time is dependent on human behavior and operational factors. What do we mean by human behavior? It means, you know, how long are you leaving the lights on, right? Um, or how, why are you leaving that window or door open and letting hot air or cool air out? Operational factors would mean, how fast am I pumping this liquid? Um, how, much, how much air needs to go through the air handler? And then when we talk about energy, this is the capacity to do work. So in physics terms, energy is what makes it possible to move objects, whether it's an electron down a wire or a car down the road. This is, th these are both examples of work being done. If we know the strength of force needed to move the object and we know how far it will move, then we can calculate the energy needed. So when you measure energy, you track, you typically track its uh, usage and trend it. So it's a nice way to get historical data. You can do the same with power. You can trend it and track it. With energy, it's more of the, uh, the quantity of it. So Lori, can you please launch the poll? Absolutely. All right, we'd like for everyone to respond to this question. What is the difference between power and energy? And we'd like for you to select all the true statements. And we will give everybody a good amount of time. Um, the options are energy equals the amount of work done and power equals the rate work is done. Energy has units of watts per hour and power has units of watts. With great power comes great responsibility. Money is saved by addressing power quality issues. And we'll give everybody a couple more minutes. Well, not minutes. No, no, no. A few more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're going to close it and we'll share the results. And 82% said energy has units of watts per hour and power has units of watts. 73% says energy equals amount of work done and power equals the rate of work that is done. And 39% um, said with great power comes great responsibility. Those are all and, the Spider-Man lovers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and 76% uh, said money is saved by addressing power issues. So um, yeah, that gives us great answers for those. And we're ready for you to move on with the presentation. Cool. Everyone's not falling asleep yet. Yay. So the, <laughs> yeah, the analogy we like to use in our, our power world, which some of you, if you're involved in power, might have heard before, and it's been given in many different ways, is called the beer analogy. Basically, if you have a nice cold mug of beer, and let's say the bartender pours you a beer, and you have roughly this amount of foam, I think that's okay. But if you have more foam, I don't know if you can see, okay, my arrow. Let's say your foam takes up, you know, three quarters of your mug. Well, guess what? You just paid, you know, however much beer is over on the East Coast or wherever you are from, you just paid for a mug of beer. I doubt you're going to be really happy to be drinking a majority of foam. So if you think of the foam as a wasted power, that's the energy that is being produced by a machine, like say a motor, but isn't actually um, providing any work. Uh, no work is being done. And that work uh, should be going into rotating, right, the shaft of the motor. So the useful power, which is the actual liquid of the beer, is the energy that is creating that rotation in your motor. It is the part that you want. It's the, the beer that you want to drink. The wasted power, it can be in forms of heat, so heat that's being produced or vibration that is being produced. Um, and then your total amount 
including the foam all the way to the bottom of the mug, that is your demand power. And that is power that's being delivered by the utility. And you can see here that each of them have um, different names. So your wasted power is reactive power, which has units of kilovolt amp reactive. Your useful power has um, the name real power, which is in kilowatts. So we just covered that, right? Wattage is power. And then demand power is your apparent power, which is kilovolt amps. It's just a nice way to remember, um, you know, there's always wasted power, just like there's always foam and beer, no matter how well you pour. So we mentioned quantity and quality um, briefly in some of the previous slides. And quantity typically has units associated with it, like volts, amps, kilowatts, um, right there, uh, KVA, uh, KVAR, power factor. And some of the actions you would that would be associated with quantified data are performing load studies to figure out if it's possible to add more machines to your facility. Another action is to trend the energy usage and get an understanding of the plant rhythm or heartbeat. Understanding how and why your facility is using energy at certain times of the day allows you to take control of that energy bill. When doing this, you may look for improvements in overall energy profile, and that's the pattern or the rhythm mentioned earlier. Quality is not usually associated with units, but with characteristics like harmonics, dips and swells, transients, flicker, unbalance. The actions you would normally take there um, are, you know, when you're trying to troubleshoot. So you measure power in terms of quality to detect any kind of reoccurring issue like nuisance tripping breakers. You would also perform in-depth analysis and find intermittent disturbances. The purpose of taking these actions are to reduce utility penalties or just avoid them completely. And we'll review some examples of surcharges later. Other reasons um, for taking power quality measures is to prolong the life of your equipment and reduce your facility's downtime. Actually, we'll cover a little bit of the surcharge or the utility bill here. So the power factor that you see here in the quantity section, utilities will charge you um, if you have poor power factor. And that's usually based on where you are located, um, not just regionally within the US, but even in the world. They have different um, uh, fees for, their, for having poor power factor. What power factor really is, is it's just a way of saying this is the quality of your facility's power. And if you have poor power factor, that means you're putting poor power back onto the utility grid and the utility is going to charge you for that. Not just for the amount of time that you put that poor power factor back onto the grid, but for your entire billing period. So if you only had poor power factor for let's say a day, you will be charged for your entire billing period, which could be a month, three month span, depending on what your contract is like. With the proliferation of computers, LED lighting, and variable frequency drives or speed drives and other sensitive devices, power quality issues are becoming increasingly um, prevalent. Um, you'd think they would be going away because of the, you know, engineering doing a better job of uh, building better equipment. To, to that extent, yes, some of it is. But for an example, uh, th there was a hospital that we stopped by recently. They had switched over to LED lighting for energy efficiency because LED lighting is more energy efficient than compared to their fluorescent bulbs, for example. I don't actually know what they were using. Um, but they also caused a lot of harmonic issues in their power, and they had some power quality issues. So they, they, they had to deploy some power quality handheld units to figure out what the issue was. And power monitoring is an important process in identifying current and potential power quality issues and addressing them before they get out of hand. Good power monitoring equipment can provide reliable information about the power quality, the demand, and the flow. So it shouldn't just be a tool that tells you, hey, this is your power. It should also be able to tell you other things like this is, this is what your harmonics looks like, right? Um, you don't want to buy like a huge Swiss Army knife tool but you do want to get, you know, maybe a two-in-one or a three-in-one tool to make the 
you know, get the most bang out of your buck. So there are many consequences of not addressing power quality issues. Power failure such as nuisance circuit breaker trips or fuses blowing, um, LED indicators on drives have also been known to blow, uh, flickering lights, overheating of machines, transformers, motors, etc., leading to a reduced useful life for those machines, and uh, nuisance tripping of variable frequency drives or adjustable speed drives, breakdowns or malfunctions of machines, electronic communication interference, and computers glitching. That's that's a one that's not very obvious, but um, can be linked to power quality issues. You can also damage sensitive equipment such as computers or um, some of the machinery that's more sensitive like uh, product line control systems. A common cause of energy waste is human and operational efficiencies, inefficiency, excuse me. This includes leaving the lights on when there's no one in the room or running the AC or heat too much or machines that are running while no product is being made. And the types of measurements to take in these cases are energy studies and looking at the energy consumption for every calendar hour or day or week or month. An example solution is to install sensors for lights so that they turn off when there's no motion. So they're basically detecting any kind of occupancy. Or um, another example is ramping back the AC or heat to a comfortable setting and figuring out when to slow down or shut down the machines that are not producing product. Like when people go on breaks, let's turn off the machines if possible, or at least slow them down. Um, operating loads exceeding the utility peak demand rate means you incur a surcharge on your utility bill. So we're on the second cause or condition here. Um, in order to avoid exceeding peak demand rates, you'd want to perform energy studies and trend the power usage of your facility. And you'll be able to figure out the right level load for your process, or if possible, move production to another shift that has a lower peak hour. Um, another common cause of energy waste is uh, worn or faulty loads. Now, war uh, compressor air leaks uh, is another example. Worn pump impellers, um, clogged air filters. And so for clogged, Air filters, as an example, you would um, that would cause the motor to work harder to push air through the filter. So replacing the filters before it gets to that point where it's clogged and the motor's working really hard um, is something you'd want to keep track of. But then there's that balance, right? You don't want to replace it too early because you'll be wasting money by replacing a filter that is still good. So that's when performing that power um, quality and energy analysis will help you figure out that sweet spot. And poor power quality is another cause for energy waste. Now, poor power quality, you that would be things like harmonics, power factor, and unbalance. These are qualitative characteristics of power quality. And using the right instrument, you can find out how to eliminate these issues. And finally, um, Incorrectly sized motors or, or uh, uh, inefficient um, processes or inefficient aged and aged motors can cause energy waste. There are instruments that will help you size your motor properly. There is an instrument that will also provide electrical power analysis as well as motor mechanical power, torque, and efficiency so that you can size your motor according to NEMA derating guidelines. Now, causes of power um, quality issues and the types of power quality issues are covered here. Um, the first one is a uh, power factor is basically a description of the efficiency, right? Um, so we went over what power factor was slightly, um, but it can be caused by inductive and capacitive loads uh, such as an oven element that is purely resistive, whereas a motor ballast that is mostly electronic devices and inductive or capacitive can cause power factor issues. Um, so the correction there would be to uh, uh, put a power factor correction circuit into your, um, into your own circuit. And not, so other causes of power quality are nonlinear loads. Uh, we kind of 
drew them out in a couple slides ago with the computers and everything. Um, so these are operating loads whose demands for energy rapidly changes, or they have sub-cycle fast changes, or they just have a different current signature, a different load signature that doesn't look like a nice, you know, three-phase uh, power demand or load. The way to, f to correct harmonic issues is to apply static or dynamic filters to your circuit. And the way that you would figure out which static or dynamic filter to use is to actually measure the harmonics and then match whatever harmonic signature there is with the filter that you're applying. So if, an, if you were hiring a out, outsourcing an engineering team to look at this, then you would, they would be looking at the circuitry itself, the harmonics, and making sure the filter cancels out that harmonics. Other causes, loads that are improperly distributed across each phase, um, that, that equates to unbalance. This is especially common, and this is electrical imbalance. This is especially common from motors, but it can be common within a facility as well. So say, for example, you have a bunch of test benches in your laboratory that are hooked up to one phase. They'll cause more current draw in that one phase, and that, one and that unbalance can cause power quality issues, and you could have intermittent tripping of your uh, test benches. Another cause or condition of power quality issues is high energy loads turning on or off, which causes variation in voltage. So um, things like dips and swells uh, would be measured here. So your voltage and your current, how much are, how much are they dipping in voltage, which is lowering in voltage, versus swelling, which is um, going beyond the nominal voltage. The solution here is to check your circuit load capacity, and if you can, and if it's applicable, resize it, and then also adjust transformer tapping in certain situations. And lastly, there are um, transients that can cause um, poor power quality, so an example of a transient that's fairly common is lightning. Now that's categorized as a fast transient. There, there are different types of transients and um, fluke tools typically detect um, most transients. So there's fast transients like lightning strikes and then there's oscillatory transients, which are like the switches um, uh, arcing, that the switch contacts arcing that may cause that kind of oscillatory transient. So a uh, solution to that is replacing the switches and then for things like lightning strikes, adding transient suppression devices. Um, Lori, this is another poll. Do you mind launching it? Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Let's go ahead and start. What are examples of power quality? Um, harmonics, dips and swells, transients and voltage. Harmonics. Uh, power quality measurements, sorry. Um, harmonics, inverse reaction current, and universal retraction, and current, parsec, dips and swells, transients, and unbalance. And we're just going to give everybody about 30 seconds to answer. And then we'll close the poll. So. We're going to go a couple more seconds. I didn't say minutes this time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to close the poll and share the results. Um, the overwhelming choice is the first one with 76%. Harmonics, dips and swells, transients, and voltage. Um, about 13% picked the last answer. So um, awesome. All right. You can, you can let us know how we how we did. <laughs> well, uh, so the the people who picked the last one are Star Trek or Star Wars lovers, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yes, that, that was good uh, the, if you picked the first one. Great, great job. Awesome. Well, we're back on your slides now. So. Okay. All right, so we focus, We kind of went over power quality uh, and energy theory and then also went over, um, you know, the causes of it. Now, when we get down to it, where, where do we actually want to look? Where do we want to focus on and where do we actually physically hook up instrumentation, right, to take the measurement. So within a facility, there are many places you can measure power quality and energy. Um, there are 
essentially, as you can see here, three subsystems that you can analyze, production process systems, building infrastructure, and electrical systems. So in this presentation, we'll go over the electrical systems. Um, when it comes to the production processes systems, that would be things like managing your airflow, your, um, your fluid flow, all that stuff. Um, that would also be like performing load studies, um, making sure that you have the correct sized motor. And then when it comes to building infrastructure, that's things like looking at your lighting, um, changing out your lighting from fluorescent bulbs to LED is a very common example, or installing occupancy sensors to make sure that you're using the lighting efficiently. So it's off when you don't need it, it's on when you do. Building envelope, um, that essentially means that you are insulating your building properly if you know if you actually own the building that you're in um, making sure that the windows are double paned for example things that you would do normally for a residential home to make it energy efficient most often they apply to buildings just on a bigger scale. And then HVAC, um, making sure that the filter, right, the air filter is being replaced when it needs to, not too early, not too soon, making sure that you're using heating and cooling properly, not blasting AC when it's, you know, negative 20 degrees out or, you know, uh, turning the heat on too much, even in the cold, you know, it, the, there's a good level, a good level for human, human comfort. Um, Electrical subsystems. So we'll we'll review that on the next slide here and, and show where we can actually take three phase electrical power measurements. It's a lot to look at, but let's start with the main service entrance and scenario one. So let's say we don't know what the problem is, but we want to measure power just in case that is a problem. So if you don't know what the problem is, you would start out typically upstream at the main service entrance, that's your best practice, and you move downstream towards what you think the problem or the issue is. Um, the reason you want to do that is you want to get an overall rating of what your energy and your power is acting like for your building for the entire building. And then you would move downstream towards what you think the problem is. So say the next place you measure is at this load bank and this load bank goes off to motor one, for example. Um, so that, let's say you troubleshoot that way, you got all the way to the disconnect of motor one and figured out that's not what's causing the issue. So let's go back here and start going down a different circuit branch, right? You'd go all the way until you find the issue. And the issue, if you don't know what the problem is, you'd wanna get a tool that sets you up for success, right? You wanna get a tool that is not difficult to use. And so a lot of what Fluke tries to do is and they try to come up with these dashboards. And I, I think they're doing a they're, we're doing a great job of it. Coming up with these dashboards that help you identify all the power quality issues. So this dashboard will display everything that we just talked about. It will set um it'll give you uh automatic settings for what is good power versus what is, you know, getting to be bad power, and then what is, oh, you should definitely address this power issue and it'll color code it. So let's say green is gonna be, okay, your system's okay here. So let's say you're measuring here at the um, at the 480 volt panel and everything's green there. He moved down the line to a sub panel. Aha, everything is in the red there. So red is our signal for, you know, you, you have a power quality issue, you should go address it. So if you don't know what you're doing, you would start, start out on this, a power quality health monitor or power quality health dashboard and that'll summarize everything for you and it'll narrow it down so let's say for example you measure here and everything's okay but you measure here and you now spot there's a harmonics issue now you know where it's happening you're getting closer to it it's like playing the that game of um 
what do you call it, hot or cold, you know, someone yells out, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you're getting hotter. It's exactly like that. So it the tool should help you find where the issue is as well as what the issue is. And then it can help you solve the problem. Um, so say if you have a harmonics issue here or, or here, wherever it is, um, let's say it's because you did swap over from fluorescent lights to LED lightings. Now you know where the power quality issue is coming from. You also know what the power quality issue is. You know it's not an unbalanced issue. You know it's not um, not a dips or swells or transient issue. It's not a rapid voltage change issue. It's specifically a harmonic issue. And now that that gets down to now you can go out and um, if you have someone internal to your facilities team, your maintenance team, great. Then they can go figure out, you know, what circuit do we need to put here to address the harmonic issues. Now, scenario two is you suspect a power quality issue but don't know where to start. Same thing, you would start at your main service entrance and you'd go down the circuit until you find the issue. Um, and in this case, though, let's say you have a power quality issue, but um, you also suspect it's motor one. Same, same thing as scenario one in my example, right? You go down the circuit of motor one, starting from the main service entrance all the way to motor one. You could, though, if you really do suspect it's motor one, you could start out right here. If you're really good at power quality, if you're confident that you know what's going on, then you could most absolutely start out here. When you don't know what's going on or you suspect there's an issue um, within the facility, you start out at the main service entrance. This is another way that you could uh, collect your data too. So instead of having, instead of starting out at the main service entrance and then moving an instrument to each part of the circuit, you can have something that is supposed to stay at your main service entrance, like this um, Fluke 1740 series. It would stay there. You can view it and control it from your computer, and then you'd have a separate module that you would take, and this is just one module getting moved to different places, that you would take to first your, the first point of the circuit, right? And then to the second point of the circuit and then the last point of the circuit. So that you can see one, you know, what is the energy being consumed, your complete total picture, two, where's the power quality issue actually occurring? Um, so this will give you your overall at the same time as you going out and having this user interface and taking it to each different spot that you think there might be a power quality issue. So just as it says right here, you log comprehensive data at the main feed while you're collecting power quality health information and energy consumption at each load. And then you compare trends, identifying processes that contribute to exceeding that max demand. And we didn't really speak about max demand, but that essentially ties back to your utility bill. If you exceed the maximum demand rate that your utility and you um, agreed on in the contract, then you also get charged an extra fee for that, for the entire billing period, not, not just for when you um, went over your demand. And then doing this also helps you identify power quality issues such as harmonics, unbalance, and power factor. So these tools are meant for that kind of um, heartbeat and rhythm data, and this is your overall rhythm of your plant. Oh, and one more thing back on here. These are variations of power quality, uh, both sensors and handheld tools. So we have a sensor called the Fluke 3540, and then the handheld tool version is the 1730 series that you can walk around your facility with. And then the Fluke 1740 series is meant to stay in one spot, really. I mean, it's module enough that you can move it to different main service entrances if you have more than one. Um, but it's... it's uh, definitely meant to stay in one spot. And it can be in a more um, industrious environment. It, it's IP65 rated, so you can actually hang it out outdoors if you need to.
whereas these ones are meant for indoors. <clears throat> so here's another poll. I think this is our last poll. It is, and we're going to ask this in two parts because we're limited by our technology um, for the webinar. So um, I'm going to launch the first part of the poll. We really want to just know what type of monitoring you're currently doing in your organization. So we have um, 10 different choices. Um, so what type are you using for this part? You can pick that you're using voltage and current, power, vibration, thermal or infrared, or ultrasonic. Um, select any of these that you're using and then I'll share the results and then we'll ask the second part um, and we'll go about 30 seconds which we've got about eight more seconds to go so answer quickly if you can and we're going to close this one and I'll share the results so um, for this first group of uh, monitoring technology 75 percent are using voltage and current 65% power, 36 vibration, 59% thermal and infrared, and 18% are using ultrasonic. So we will launch the second part. And you have the option to select pressure, oil and lubricant monitoring, acoustic monitoring, temperature, or other. And again, we'll, we'll go about 30 seconds for this one. And um, does it surprise you, Han, that so many people are using power, um, current, and voltage monitoring? No, not really. Mainly because um, this presentation is, you know, leaning towards people who are interested in power. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> Whereas um, if this presentation was for ultrasonic, I think people would be leaning be that way. Yeah, <laughs> you would probably be surprised by that. Okay. Well, we're going to close. <clears throat> excuse me. This poll. And we'll look at the results. <clears throat> so here's 74% of folks are using temperature measurements, 49 pressure, 44 oil and lubricant, 11 acoustic, and then 15% are using other. So um, if you're interested in letting us know what those others are, you can comment in the question section. I'd like to know what that is. All right, so we are gonna go back to your slides now, Han. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone for taking that poll. Okay, um, we kind of went over, well, we did go over where you would physically hook up and take measurements. And um, something I didn't uh, cover in the previous slide that I want to go back to really quick. When we're looking at the um, these measurements here, another place that you would measure is at the disconnect switch or at your VFD or variable frequency drive. Um, with certain fluke power quality tools that can take uh, measurements at that point and then also provide you with motor information. And basically you're measuring voltage and current like you would be up here at your load or at your main service entrance. But in addition to providing you uh, power quality and energy analysis, it also provides you with mechanical information such as your torque or the efficiency of your motor. So you can see if you sized your motor properly. Did you get a motor that's too big and you're wasting money and energy by running it for a process that doesn't require that much, that big of a motor? Or did you get a motor that's too small? Or maybe you have been adding more and more load to that motor. And do you have any you know, capacity left for that motor to handle? What's interesting about the, the uh, motor analysis piece is that it only requires you to hook up by a voltage and current. It does not require you to hook anything up to the rotor, to, to the stator, anything on the motor. You don't need to physically touch the motor in this measurement, which helps people. Um, there are examples of people using this because they don't have time to take the motor apart, apply, for example, torque sensors, right? If you want to actually know what your torque is outputting. And they um, would use the efficiency measurements to make a case for saying, hey, we should get a more energy efficient motor, for example. Um, so it's, it's definitely a nice tool and uh, we were saying before you know you want to get kind of a nice Swiss Army knife of tools um, and not just get one tool that does one thing although you can get one tool that does one thing very well um, 
these Fluke tools does multiple things very well. Here we'll go over, um, we're switching gears here. We're gonna go over a few of the software attributes of uh, Fluke and, and kind of show you what data you can look at. So we'll first hit up this power quality health dashboard or summary or monitor, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, this is the screen that I was talking about before that says green if you're good, red if you're bad, yellow if something's going on, but not quite enough to react to it yet. So here you have um, five different sections. This keeps this column keeps track of your frequency. These columns here are your three phases um, for your voltage variations and these three columns sets of columns here are for your harmonics and your voltage variations this keeps track of unbalance and this tallies up the number of events that occurs events are things like dips and swells um, rapid voltage changes for example this dashed line up here tells you your limit and your limit is set by what you choose here in this drop down in your limit setting right now we have it set to en 5160 and en 5160 is a uh, standard for how people should take power quality measurements the other option you could choose is ieee 519. um so yeah as you can see here uh really nice visual chart uh, to tell you, you know, do you have a power quality issue or not? In this case, it looks like phase A has a voltage variation that has a power quality issue. And there have been 17 events that you can drill down into. So um, it counts up the events and you can also look at waveforms. So various Fluke tools have different levels of this dashboard. There's an, another one that's a bit more comprehensive. It will take uh, into account your main signaling um, and some other attributes like Flickr that uh, you might be interested in seeing. This is a view that will help you understand your plant rhythm, but this is more of a drilled down version of the plant rhythm. So the first um, thing you would do here is you take a look at your weekly and daily manufacturing cadence Monday through Friday right for example if you don't have um, people working on the weekends and then you'll look for peaks that may or may not exceed the demand interval so um, you could physically draw a line here in Excel if you if you uh, exported this to for example a CSV file and you could see um, if you have went over any kind of peak demand rate and this is a good way to get a view of your daily cadence of your energy consumption but it also um, allows you to plot out your energy savings and make sure that you have a good uh, line of sight to where your energy consumption is going so you'd plot this out over time and then figure out if it fits your overall plant profile and what we mean by plant profile, so if you go to the next view, is the plant rhythm and calendar view. So this is giving you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, your entire week, including the weekends, to understand and get a nice at a glance view of what your power is and your energy usage is. Actually, this is energy, not your power. So yeah, you can select power if you want down here. Um, but this right now is currently on your energy usage view. And you can see here in this example on Saturday when we know this facility doesn't have anything running um, and there's really no one in the building besides maybe a security guard, I don't know. Um, you shouldn't be using this much energy on a Saturday. And so it's a nice way to go through and be like, okay, the Monday makes sense. Tuesday, yeah, we really, you know, kick up a lot of machinery there. It's a little bit high on the energy usage but we expect it um, Wednesday's normal Thursday's normal Friday's normal oh wait what's going on with Saturday you know um, it's a nice view and maybe they left the heat going in the building who knows or the AC building or AC in the building was blasting Now, when you dig into the events, this is what it looks like. So you go into the events list and you, it'll list out the type. So it'll say dip or swell or voltage variation or some other event. It'll tell you how long that swell or that event happened, then how much beyond the expected 
uh, measurement, in this case voltage, how much beyond the expected voltage was it, and then what was the absolute voltage measurement, and what phase did it happen on, and what severity it is, right? Severity would be ranked by um, the standard, I believe. So uh, this looks like many swells happened at a high severity, and you can actually go into the waveform and see what the swell looked like. Um, so this this screen here, this tab here, allows you to kind of drill down to even more detail. Then let's say you also looked at your harmonics. You can select which harmonic and which phase you're looking at. So this is your harmonic histogram. Basically, it bucketizes everything. So this is your first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. We didn't talk too much about harmonics, but basically um, a harmonic is an interval of your primary frequency. So let's say you're operating at 60 hertz. Your second harmonic would be 120 hertz and so on down the line. So right now, the screen is showing that you've selected your third harmonic and you're able to drill down into details in, into it so that you can see, okay, does this increase actually correspond to a particular machine that's on at the time? Because it has date and timestamps. You can now go back and look and say, ah, it was my arc furnace coming on at this time. I know it comes on at this time and that's what cause that's what's causing the harmonics. Well, now you can go and address that, right? Now you know what machine it is and what kind of harmonics it's causing and you can go and design a circuit to compensate for that harmonics or have someone design it for you. Um, we're going to skip the live demonstration of Energy Analyze Plus, but basically the tool is extremely powerful in the sense that you can overlay information from different data files and that'll help you in terms of troubleshooting and identifying issues that are intermittent that could be occurring on Monday but are not occurring on Tuesday for example so you can take multiple files and overlay them and then you can see you know this is what my waveform looks like here or this is how I'm trending here oh I see this gigantic um, uh, voltage swell on this date. Why is it not happening on Monday? That kind of thing. So it helps you narrow down again. It's just another, it's basically allowing you to take this and allowing you to shift the time for multiple files. If there were multiple files here, this is just one. Um, but you can imagine this peak moving, but the green and the blue lines are staying in one spot. So you can kind of match up the hour and the day, however you want. So that's all we have for this presentation, Lori. Yeah, we have a couple questions that have come in and we've got about um, five or six minutes to answer some, so we'll get to as many as we can. If you have any other questions, please send them in and we will get with Han to answer them on our blog um, in the next week or so, so that we can get to all the questions if we don't get to them all today. So please send in your questions. Um, the first one that came in was um, some motors are equipped with temperature sensors that indicate abnormal behavior. Is it important to measure all three phases separately or is measuring one phase okay, keeping in mind the cost of in instrumentation? Right, yeah, so if your, your motor is likely three phase motor, so you'll wanna measure all three phases simultaneously. And the reason why is because unbalance can cause issues with the motor and if, and power is, it changes, it's very dynamic. So if you go around and you only measure, let's say you have a digital multimeter and you just measure one phase, well, that only gives you one picture of why your motor might be having issues with temperature. Um, so you're gonna want to measure all three phases. Yes, keeping in mind that, you know, that adds more to the cost of your instrument. Think about how much that motor costs and how critical is to your facility and um, you know the the cost benefit might outweigh there, uh, so it might be worth investing in a three phase motor analyzer or you know one of the fluke tools that provides you with three phase measurements, simultaneous three phase measurements. 
Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, how do the instruments you've mentioned in the presentation um, earlier communicate? Is it Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth? or a combination great question so it depends on which type of instrument you get so the the ones that i mentioned in the presentation the two were the three were um the fluke 1740 series we'll cover that first that has ethernet that has wi-fi that has bluetooth um it you can also it has a, a usb port so you can actually hook up a um a hotspot, a 4G hotspot, for example. So you can actually even get cellular um, connection if you need to, uh, to really have that true remote um, connectivity where maybe you don't have internet, right? But you have a cellular connection. Then uh, the Fluke 1730 uh, series, um, that includes the 1732, 34, 36, and 38. Those can be hooked up via Wi-Fi, um, USB cable, or Bluetooth. And then the uh, Fluke 3540 sensor, power quality sensor, that is also Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Awesome, thank you. And I'm going to assume that you will know what EMI stands for, but the question is, EMI measuring capability of Fluke equipment, question mark. Electromagnetic interference, I assume is what you mean there. Um, so what, it depends on what kind of EMI uh, detection you want. And, and really, we don't dabble in that too much. But having said that, the there's a specific model, the Fluke um, 438 Series 2, which has motor uh, analysis to it. It uses current signature analysis and a very complex algorithm to pick up on very um, slight fluctuations in your uh, rotor harmonics. And so that's as close as we get to EMI detection. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing this person wants to have a kind of a sniffer, which is not something we have in, in the power quality line, I should say. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, that is, how common is it to find power quality issues caused by utilities versus power quality issues caused by a facility's equipment? Yeah, so um, it really depends on where you are in the world. So within the U.S., we typically have good utility power. Um, our utilities are regulated. They provide power to a certain um, degree of quality. And so you'll find that a majority of the time, the power quality issues will be coming from within the facility. Um, now, when you go to other parts of the world, that is not always the case, especially in um, third world countries where the power is not very dependable. So uh, a lot of the times the power quality issue could be coming from outside the facility and it could actually be coming from um, the utility itself. There is a scenario, however, within the US where let's say your neighbor down the road has extremely poor power quality, they could affect your facility. So it isn't coming from the utility, it's actually coming from your neighbor. Um, but still the chances of that happening, less likely. Um, it's gonna be within, at least for the US, it'll be within your facility. Those are great questions, by the way. Yeah, but great questions. We had a couple more that we don't have time for, so I think we will come to you and let you answer these in a blog post in the coming weeks. And um, thank you again so much for presenting for us, Han. Um, that concludes our presentation. Um, there'll be a brief survey at the end, so please hang on the line um, attendees and answer the survey for us to help us make sure we continue to give you relevant and helpful information. And Han, thanks again for presenting. No, thank you. Everybody have a great afternoon. Bye.